The full format lineup for our Christmas live show, Traitor at Culinary Castle, is now locked in. We've got over 11 hours of food trials, interactive challenges, and chefy showings off across the weekend of the 14th and 15th of December live in this castle. With a full scale professional film crew and a genuinely secret traitor amongst us, hell bent on sabotaging the challenges without getting caught by us or you. We've gone really big this time. So watch along, interact, and impact exactly what happens all weekend. You can watch live or on demand for 30 days. All the info and further details for all the formats are in the link in the description or the QR code. Today, you guys are in for a real treat. We're gonna explore four global cooking techniques and we've got a chef and a normal to first of all try and guess what they are and then put them to the test. Can you guess which is which? You mean the chef and the normal? <laughs> I think I'm becoming more normal. Yes! <laughs> We're probably gonna meet in the middle one day. Boys, the first one is under the cloche. Have a lift and have a guess. Oh. Is this a cooking utensil? I was thinking cooking instantly it, right? like some sort of solidified plant branch or bamboo root. Bamboo, but... It is bamboo. Technically it's a bamboo. grass, but woody would be a good description. Do you steam within the bamboo? You've got to steam, steam within the bamboo. Is it bamboo steaming? It is exactly that. So there's... Lots of parts of the world that Meeting use this, perhaps traditionally in China, in the Yunnan province, in the southwest corner of China. But actually today we're going to explore a Thai dish. The dish is cow lamb and you're going to give it a go. Okay, we've got something ricey, coconutty. It smells kind of sweet, but... It smells delicious. It smells of sweet, good, fresh coconut. What? This guy has nailed it. It is rice, coconut and sugar. Little bit of coconut milk and uh, grated coconut, little bit of salt as well, so it's not just sweet. And you've got your little plugs. So here's how it's gonna work. You're gonna cover the bottom of the bamboo tube with some tin foil. Now, traditionally this might be a banana leaf, but actually just something to seal in any liquid dribble. Then you're gonna put a small plug into the tube, fill it with your rice, coconut, coconut milk, sugar and salt filling. Then the big plug goes on top, and then we can either steam or bake them. Perfect. Now the rice has been soaking, like a cold soak, in the coconut milk with some shredded coconut, sugar and salt. And it's raw rice. And it's raw rice. So the reason that it's obviously not dry is just because it's taken in all that, all, all that moisture. Okay. And was I right in saying, is this savoury? I mean, obviously it's got sugar in it, but is it? A... It's a sticky coconut rice. This is probably more on the sweet side, but this method is used for both savoury and sweet dishes. Now, obviously, it doesn't have to just be rice inside. You can also put little pieces of meat or vegetables, herbs, spices. If it's a savoury one, you could add all sorts of different things to it as well. OK, how do we cook? Then you can cook them a number of ways. So traditionally, they might go over an open fire. And basically, once the bamboo is black and smoked and charred, you get that kind of smoky charred flavour on the rice, as well as the fragrance of the bamboo tube. Or you can roast them in an oven, which is how we're going to do it. Or you can just steam them. So in big pots, you can have loads of these stood up loads them in a, in a big pan, all stood up steaming, and then they can be served. So it can also be street food. And we can pop those into an oven, relatively hot, so that it roasts, partly steams, the moisture from the bamboo helps the rice, the rice absorbs the coconut milk, voila. We'll come back to them when they're cooked. There we go. Fantastic. And cool. served with? Just some ripe papaya. Papaya. So if you take your tin foil off, you should have your little pokey stick and you should be able to push the bottom plug all the way up and it'll push the rice as sticky sweet rice into your bowl uh, so you have one long cylinder of sticky rice. We have a rice <laughs> Yes, that's cylinder. exactly what. Oh. It's looking good. Looks great. Are these reusable? So, the beautiful thing about these is they are reusable to a point, it depends on how much they've been smoked, Amazing. or completely compostable. So for street food vendors, it is better than using plastic or an alternative that basically gets wasted. That's exactly how I hoped it would taste. The texture of biting through the coconut is still there and you unlock the flavour in amongst all that delicious sweet rice. Yeah, great texture. Every bite. Very subtle. Um, it's definitely not as sweet as I thought it would be. No. Obviously cooking it in this means it's compact, tight, 
and I think it being in a cylinder does give a different element of eating. You made a great point when we weren't rolling that this would be amazing for cooking for guests and you just serve them one of those each. So you're spot on with the texture and some people say it is such a unique texture from cooking inside bamboo that you cannot get that specific texture any other way because it kind of cooks and steams but also doesn't have anywhere to go. So it's sticky but also bouncy. And whilst we mentioned that it's street food vendors that are often selling these either over coals or steaming them and therefore the containers are disposable and really easy, traditionally it would have been people going to hunt and gather who might have been away from the home for longer than a daily commute <laughs> and therefore a pocket of rice and some fresh spring water in nature's saucepans is the way forward because you wouldn't necessarily want to travel with lots of pots and pans dangling around your neck because you look like this. <laughs> <laughs> Live show spoiler. Excellent. Well, do you want to move to another part of the world? Yes, please. Mm. I'll be fascinated by this one because I think you'll know them, but I don't know if you've ever made them. Oh, I know this. <laughs> well, these these little the the French the French like, spongy sweet yeah. things. Yeah. What are they, what are they called? Canelays. 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 We're going to make. They're usually sold in multiples, so eight canelay. These are beautiful French pastries, specifically from the Bordeaux region, and it is a batter made from flour, egg, sugar, milk, vanilla, and rum. But it is their wonderful color and shine on the outside with a slightly almost custardy middle that gives them their uniqueness. Very dense, almost slightly burnt on the outside, like they go very dark. There is a fantastic history about them, which we'll come back to, but first we're gonna start making them. And you need to line your molds. Any ideas with what? Probably butter. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good French. guess. <laughs> We're wrong, of course. Obviously wrong. Beeswax. Beeswax. Ah, oh, cool. Melted Just beeswax so. is used to line the inside of the moulds no and then the batter goes in. You cook them at a really high temperature to start off with to get a nice golden colour early on and then you turn the temperature down to get that custardy middle. I've never seen anything like that. So this is very traditional with the beeswax. Perhaps more common modern day would be butter as just lining a mold, but traditionally it's beeswax. And that's what gives it that almost shiny, almost waxy uh, glaze over them. Traditionally they would have been copper, better heat distribution, the little tins they would have used, lined with beeswax. And then once that beeswax has set and solidified, you put in the batter. Now, obviously as they go back in the oven, they melt again, but you're basically creating a non-stick surface inside of the tins. Okay, so just like a little bit, right? Just enough to swill around, you can, or you can put them all in one and swill from one to the other. Basically enough to make sure it coats all the sides. Oh, it sets really fast. Yeah, I tried wow. to move too quick and then I set it on myself. The other rationale is to slightly warm your moulds. Uh, obviously more difficult to handle, you then need sort of hot cloths and stuff. So we're going all in one. And you and can literally we'll pour it into, into the into next that. and you get a nice coating. Ah, oh, it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> Great, cool. look at that. So traditionally they would have been copper on the outside, always this shape but different sizes, and they wouldn't have had a non-stick coating inside, which is why the beeswax is important. So these are delicious pastries, can be eaten for breakfast or later in the day as a snack with wine. And because we're talking Bordeaux, it tends to be red wine, although obviously Bordeaux makes excellent white wines and sweet wines too. There you go. Oh no! How much do we fill them, Evers? <laughs> <laughs> now you start by baking them in a pretty high oven, so 230 degrees Celsius for like 15 minutes, then you turn the oven down and they'll cook for another half an hour, so about 45 minutes in total. And you should get a really dark, rich colour on the outside and like a gooey, chewy middle. Wow. There is a bakery in London called Babel, and that's where we bought these from. So these are perfect. Look I'm at excited. that. Look at that. It's really dark. Mizzle. Look how yeah. dark it is. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> okay. Now, what have we got in the middle? Because that's, let's talk about the differences. That's amazing because it's not, it's almost a flaky sponge, isn't it? It's a sponge, but it's almost layered in texture. So the center has just taken on that really sort of moist, 
rum and vanilla flavour, while the egg, the outside is almost rubbery. Yeah, in, in a lovely, it's chewy, chewy, yeah. chewy. It's so essential that these are really dark because mm. you get that bitter, bitter flavour as well. That's the best bit about it, I actually think. So we don't know when these actually were invented, but way back in 1663 there was a group of people who basically tried to pass it as an act within the Bordeaux Parliament as being only they could make them. But because they fell outside of the pastry chef guild, they weren't allowed to use milk and sugar. So they fought against that. And eventually it kind of went in their favor and they said they could use it, but then they limited the number of cannoliere shops that there were to just eight per town. But despite only that- Eight, eight per a town? town. <laughs> But despite that, there like were 39 it. in this one particular town because they just went, these are so good, we don't care about your laws, we're going to make them. And as recent as the 1990s, which I think was probably when the peak in the Gironde region of Bordeaux, 4.5 million were eaten each year in don't just that region of, yeah. in just that region of Bordeaux. I reckon I could have polished four of those off. You can decorate them as well. You can decorate them, you can fill them with other fillings. There's not much room inside for filling, but sometimes they're piped on top or things are injected into them now as a modern classic, but traditionally just rum, vanilla, and that texture that we love. This is how they turn out, right? Fantastic. One other final thought, perhaps these came about because they required lots of egg yolks to make and the egg whites were used in wine clarification. Bordeaux made a lot of wines, they had a lot of egg yolks left over. Maybe that's why this pastry is such uh, a classic in Bordeaux. Who knows? Either way, we love them and they're now available all over France and we can get them just down the road here in London too. Would you like to try a third global cooking technique? Yes. Yes. Where are we going now? Lift the cloche. It's your turn. It's my turn. Oh, that's pretty. It's a wand. Oh, it's got loads of holes in it, hasn't it? So you, you obviously fill the holes with something or press it down like pancakes. I think I've seen something like this before. Oh, you are I think I saw it on Instagram We will never meet in the middle. I think you dip it in batter, so you just coat the bottom. Yeah. And then, I don't know what happens next. <laughs> and then? Then you cook it. <laughs> and then you cook it. So it's a method of cooking that I think happens in two different ways in two parts of the world. We're gonna focus on Malaysian fried cookies. Okay. Oh, instantly in. So I think it's pronounced Kui Loyang, and essentially they're deep fried batter cookies. So this is all about delicate timing. Oh, wonderful. We have, <laughs> I say we, Kush has had a go at making these and they took a bit of getting used to. Oh dear. He said it's the most fiddly, patience involved process, but the most satisfying once you can get it and you get the knack. Sounds like a challenge. These are loved in Malaysia because they are so intricate, so beautiful, so crispy and sweet and delicious, and somebody else has made them for you. There are similar methods in places like Scandinavia where they will use uh, metal cups to create very, very small, almost like canapé moulds, like tiny, tiny little uh, canapé moulds are done exactly the same way with a slightly different batter, and it's dipping into oil, dipping into batter, dipping into oil, and then they pop them off, and you can fill them with all sorts of fillings for canapés, uh, now popular across uh, much of Europe, but that started in Scandinavia. Similar method, but it's not a sweet cookie batter. It's a rice flour batter, so rice flour, a little bit of tapioca flour, sugar, uh, and that's about it. Coconut milk, that's the liquid. Okay, so I dip. Dip. Be generous. A few seconds, 10 seconds. Yeah, because you want to warm that little rosette iron up. Then lift and dab to get rid of excess oil so you don't oil your batter too much. Then dip into your batter, hold it there for a bit, but not all the way submerged. It will start to cook. Then you can lift it out and give it a little shake to remove any of the okay, go. loose bits. And then back into the oil. It's really hard to see the colour. And then in theory, the you want. You might even, in the oil, just be able to shake it and it will fall off, which enables you to do a few more and have them floating around in the oil to finish cooking. You might find, for the first few, you just want to get it perfect and then ease it off onto the plate with the tongs. I mean, I know I haven't done it yet, but it's it's very satisfying. It's very it satisfying. It feels to nice to do. It's probably yeah. about there on yeah, colour. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just think. Oh, Quick, there you go. Get it popped off nicely. I'm going out. Oh, God, oh, God. He's oh going to carry on cooking, oh, James. Oh. Ah, James! Ah, James! <laughs> Okay. Your first attempt is excellent. Oh, uh, these look at that. are after a little bit of practice, what Kush has crafted. Wow, you get some clean lines, don't you? Mm. With a bit more depth, which I think this one will give you. It might even shake off now. 
Oh, if it shakes off, then you get a little bit more colour of the inside. But the iron is also cooking inside and out. And then scoop it out. Oh, he's, he's double. He's dual. You are. We'll never meet in the middle. Hey, that was a good one. That's Look at that. Great, great one. Blinding. Good, great job. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers. Fantastic. Hmm. What do they remind me of? Fortune they cookies. Remind me. They remind me of yeah. fortune cookies. Yeah. They remind me of, yeah, they're fortune cookies, almost. Very light, wafery, crispy cookie, but a fried cookie. I think that's quite unique. I can't think of many other fried cookies. So Kui Loyang, that's Malaysian, but these are popular in places like Singapore, a lot of other parts of uh, Southeast Asia, often with celebrations. So festival time, because they're beautiful, they're intricate, they're also quite tricky, so they're not an everyday cookie. They're a special treat, um, but they are loved for that very reason. You can really taste the um, deep fried element as well. I've got one more up my sleeve that I don't think you've cooked with before. Great. Do you want small? This one doesn't quite fit under the cloche, but do you want to lift it anyway? It's my yeah. turn. It's a gadget. Oh. oh! Oh! So you know what this is? I think I know what this is, yeah. And I think he's quite excited by it. Yeah. Oh, it's got, is that, it's got like a grill, yeah. like a heating element. Does this get warm and you cook something on there and then put it here? Maybe it's not your forte. I, I think it's a raclette grill. Melty cheese. It is a raclette. Racleur being the French for to scrape. Gotcha. So you just put a big hunk of cheese yeah. there. You melt it and then, okay, cool. You do put a big hunk oh. of cheese. Oh! oh. We got it on max. It's heating up very yeah, quickly. Yeah, it's getting hot. Raclette gives its name both to the process, which stems from to scrape, i.e. to melt cheese and then scrape. But now this kind of Alpine Swiss cheese also takes on the name Raclette. And then you raise it up or down, depending on the size of your cheese. How? And close. the temperature you want it. And ideally, you want a little bubble, possibly even a little bit of coloration on top. Hey, cool. Right, ready? Yeah. Are you happy? Uh, I, yeah. Oh. So you should be able to lower it and tip it, and it should just scrape off. It's considered quite an art form. Some restaurants just do this. You might get fondue and or raclette, but they'll come to your table. Sometimes it's you do it yourself, sometimes they do it for you, and you get scraped oh, cheese. Wonderful. That's delicious. The whole room smells incredible. So while you start to bubble your next bit, you can enjoy the hot cheese you've just scraped before it solidifies. Conserve it over or with whatever. Vegetables, for sure. But often it's just potato, bread, uh, saucisson and some pickles. I'm doing a open sandwich. Cheers. Cheers. It's delightful. I mean, it's for fat. What's not to like? It's incredibly social because it happens often at the table and you can have it DIY scraped or someone could be your scraper. Traditionally, it was a good way of keeping cheese. So the Alpine cows, they make great cheese in the spring and summer when the grass is lush and then the cheese matures for a few months and come the winter, you can enjoy this delicious cheese, best warmed and scraped. I love the mechanics of this device. I mean, I'm assuming that this is going back a while, so what would they have used in place of this well-designed, engineered electrical gadget. Exactly the same, but it would have been a hot plate. And there are some that you can get that are almost V-shaped with two heating systems, and you put like a wedge of cheese in, and then you can scrape both sides, so you've like, got double scrapage. As a Cheevan, um, it doesn't taste as funky as it smells. So it originated in Valais, which is in Switzerland. So we are talking like Swiss cows, cow milk, and a cow milk cheese. It's alpine, which gives it kind of a nutty, grassy flavour. It's not that funky to taste. Yeah, really fun. Good. Really great. So we've done France, Switzerland, Malaysia and Thailand, four global cooking methods. Comment down below, have you ever cooked any of those methods yourself? And are there any others around the world that we've not yet tried on the channel? I can think of one, a land far, far away, where we're hosting our Christmas live show in a castle. You can find out all the information and get tickets below.